We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry for the delay. And Hickey, your sound is, is muted. You need to unmute. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I believe we, we, are, we are online now. So, good afternoon, good evening for all. My name is Henrique Falhaber, and I will be moderating this section today. I am a representative of the private sector of a uh, Brazilian Internet Streaming Committee, CIBR, which is the multi-staker body working towards the development of the internet in Brazil. Thank you very much uh, for joining this workshop session, which is titled Regulating Digital Platforms from and for the Global South. As uh, you are aware, the issue of platform regulation and related matters are hot topics within the global internet policy agenda. In fact, it's, it's a multifaceted discussion that involves a myriad of topics and mobilizes several society debates. This workshop was proposed in the context of a broader work being made uh, within CGIBR and the working group on platform regulation. As an outcome of the working group, the goal is to consolidate here uh, regarding regulatory frameworks for digital platforms that take in consideration the structural challenges of countries from the global south, such as Brazil, towards sustainable digital development and welfare. The key takeaways and potential recommendations that will be extracted from here will feed a compilation of regulation proposals that you will consider dividing issues such as competition, content moderation, and other. Uh, is, this is uh, made, it, it, to be made available for the interest stakeholders and especially useful for our global South countries that are discussing their own regulations. For these sections, we seek to cover a set of policy issues, such as regulation, social and economic inclusion, public policy and regulation tools to mitigate negative effects of digital platforms, and the role of multi-stakeholderism multi within these debates. Uh, the speakers for this session are Anita Vierowska Domowska, from the technical community. Uh, she comes from Onesbrook University. Uh, she comes from Eastern European Regional Group. We have also uh, the Brazilian Renata Avila from Cyber Society. Uh, he, she's uh, open, director of Open Knowledge. And we have uh, also from India, Subahit Padra uh, from Cyber Society. He's principal of Omida Network. And we have also uh, Mr. Emmanuel Vitus from the private sector. He's the executive director of the African Group. Uh, we have also our colleague Augustina Ordonez. She is from the technical community, is fellow at Yale University, and works before with the Chamber of Deputies. I invite all, all the participants to complement their own views during the first time they speak in the session, if they want. Uh, highlight the information they they consider more relevant. Uh, without further ado, let's quick start the session. The debate uh, will organize around three main policy questions that may guide participants, interventions and discussions. Uh, first question, 
which are the main aspects that should be taken into account when regulating digital platforms to promote social and economic inclusion? The second question, are traditional antitrust measures and competition safeguards enough to address structural digitalization related sense of global self? Uh, the, third, the third question, what is the role of multi-stakeholderism and governments from global South countries in platform uh, governance uh, in order to boost digital economy, enable a more inclusive economic growth? We will start uh, with an intervention by Dr. Aneta, who will give a brief presentation on the most globally known ongoing discussion that is taking place uh, within Europe, as well as some potential links with Global South concerns. After that, the other speakers will have up to 10 minutes each to give their vision and describe their local experience on these issues. Uh, following the initial intervention, we will then have a queer Q&A and, and a debate with the audience. For that, we will be receiving questions from attendants through the channels of IGF. And at the end, I will do a brief wrap up uh, of the session. You may find all this information on, you need, on the IGF website that contains all the guidelines necessary for participation. To request the floor, in this section, uh, please use the raise hand feature on the Zoom platform. Uh, you may also post your question on the chat, uh, on the Q&A pod, and we encourage everything to use the hashtag with social media plus the hashtag for the session. Hashtags are uh, WS169 platforms regulation IJF 2021. Uh, I believe you have a great session. Please, Anita, the floor is yours. Anita? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm trying to share a screen, but I'm disabled by the host at the moment. Could I get the uh, possibility to share a screen? Wait, wait a few seconds. I think they should allow you to do so. Let me check. Otherwise, I do it myself. <clears throat> I am now co host and I will attempt one more time. Yes, it should work. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome everyone, uh, whatever the time of uh, the day you are at at the moment, which is so nice uh, to have uh, this, this, this uh, <clears throat> changes. Uh, this different perspective, even on the uh, what the time uh, is now. Uh, my name is Aneta <clears throat> Viviroska. First of all, I would like to apologize for the way I'm performing. This is due to the fact that I got ill. It's not COVID, it's just a cold. But <clears throat> that means that I'm having problems just speaking. That also means that I will be quick because I'm afraid that at certain moment I will just stop uh, speaking at all. Uh, and I would like it to be at the end of my uh, presentation, not in the middle. Uh, I'm Polish. Uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm based in Germany when I'm, uh, where I'm doing my habilitation. So finishing book to, to, to get me to uh, the status of professor. 
I have, what is my relation to platform regulation? I have been one of the uh, uh, people responsible for project that was conducted uh, by the uh, European Law Institute uh, to prepare set of rules, model law for regulating uh, online intermediary platforms, which was, uh, I, could, I can say quite a success and had an impact on how um, um, what the approach is within the European Union uh, to regulating platforms. And this is, this is the background uh, that also gave me a possibility to act as, ex as an expert for, for example, European Parliament in the area of platform regulation. Uh, but at the same time, uh, even though I have uh, quite large legislative background. Uh, I was working in Poland um, doing that and I was negotiating in the European uh, Council uh, various uh, private law instruments. I must stress <coughs> that I am a private lawyer and me being a private, private lawyer that really sets my perspective. Uh, this is the angle from which I look at a problem and of course uh, platforms are quite peculiar from this position because what we are witnessing right now uh, and what we are participating in is a creation of a completely new world. And this world functions based on platform structure. And it is parallel uh, to the on-site world that we, we are used to. Uh, complexity of this new platform world should probably be reflected in the structure of the rules that apply to regulate it. Or if one has a bit more ambitions, um, is a visionary or lunatic, somewhat that, that depends on the point of view of that person, to steer its development. And what I understand from today's session is to just focus on how can we steer that development of, of platforms to promote social and economic inclusion. Uh, this is about making law, political decisions, whatever you, you, you choose uh, as a tool of social engineering. And of course, since my mothership is private law, uh, this, is, this is a bit overwhelming because private law has its clear limits. Uh, those limits disappear when you think about platforms because plat also platforms, but the, 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 there are many um, elements that impact this process, change what private law is. Um, but, but basically we are talking about using law as a tool of social engineering and the question of its limits. I would like to present to you <coughs> what is happening in the European Union. Um, and um, not only legislatively, but conceptually, how the approach is being shaped towards online platforms. So first, I will talk about this process, how you see it very briefly, how market is reshaped by uh, online platforms. Then I was, I, my next step will be to talk about policy choices that arise on the basis of this change market um, uh, reality. Then I will present to you the, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, the legislative instruments that are already in place in the European Union and then those that are only in the legislative pipeline. So they are being negotiated by the European um, bodies. And then at the end of the day uh, and my presentation, uh, some, some conclusions that I'm afraid are not too uh, optimistic. So first, uh, <clears throat> first, uh, platform economy is different. The market is different. Uh, the, 
the market is different from the market that we had 20, 30 years ago. And our law still is based on this old uh, structure of the market. What is so peculiar about the market reshaped by online platforms? First, and, and you know, I don't want to dig into discussion too much here. I just like to uh, stress what the European approach to that is, because I guess this is very similar to, um, to um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, the conclusions are going to be similar in this regard. So platform, online platforms, act as gatekeepers and private regulators. Uh, so they basically organize market, which they later, they dominate. And uh, from our perspective, from my perspective, as a person that was involved in creating model rules on online platforms, the, um, uh, and from private law perspective, one of the biggest uh, challenges was that uh, Online platforms are more than just a party to a contract. They set the rules they need to obey, hopefully, but <clears throat> they cannot be uh, put at the same, in the same approach as being in the same position as other uh, participants of the online uh, markets. And here is where private law falls, falls short. This requires public. Uh, law approach. Then another characteristic that really has a strong impact on how the market is functioning is the uh, is that market domination uh, scaling is the survival strategy. So the concept of the platform is to get is to become large, uh, which impacts the way it functions. Next. Uh, use of data-driven network effect, which creates entry barriers for competition. And you know all these elements that I'm listing, these sound like competition law issues, but seriously, can competition law really address it properly? That, that will be the first question. Um, and economy of scale and scope. So once you are a large platform, uh, you enjoy strong economies, not only, only of the scale, which is something that we are used to somehow, but also economies of scope. You, you can enter new markets and develop new products at a lower cost than uh, <coughs> entrance or even established players, which puts you in a completely different position uh, as all other market participants. Uh, and of course, economies of scale and economies of scope uh, appear to be particularly strong when it comes to uh, accumulation and use of the data relating to customer behavior. So, you know, you are just organizing, using, uh, adapting market to your needs. But this leads us to uh, power, Platform, <clears throat> online platforms having power over market, but not only on that, also society and democracy. Because whereas we uh, private lawyers, we tend to look from uh, the economic uh, perspective on how the markets are organized. Uh, with platforms, this really is merged with all other aspects of the functioning, uh, data collection, data use and impact on society. And this is again, when where uh, private law falls short. I'm oh, sorry, I... Uh, so, uh, what are the policy choices? Some new, some old, and some borrowed. Actually, they are not borrowed, they are more lent than borrowed. Because, you know, if you think, if you, if you, if you think about uh, new policy choices, uh, we have, New market structure, which comes from infrastructure power of platforms. You have new contract structure because you used to have bilateral contracts in chains, and right now you have triangle as the leading form of contract. Then you have data based 
economy, which also uh, combines private public um, problems, you have artificial intelligence and expansion, and this is in itself self-standing huge problem when it comes to functioning of society, functioning of markets. And then you have all sorts of societal, political uh, impacts and you know pandemic and fake news and uh, impact on, 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 on elections worldwide uh, does not really need an explanation. Then we, <laughs> then we have some old uh, policy choices, abuse in power, uh, in contractual relations. This, this is as old as the word is. Uh, and in, in, in Europe, paradox, on European Union, paradoxically, uh, this more has to do with abuse and power in business to business relation or platform to business relation, because we have already quite strong consumer protection. Data protection and our obsession, European obsession about data protection, it started even before platforms. And then some borrowed, or as I said, lent. This is about platforms becoming quasi-states, uh, becoming quasi-regulator, overtaking powers of the state to regulate sectors of market or markets. Then you have, at the same time, increasingly reliance of states on platforms. Because, you know, think an easy example, where do you look <clears throat> to check how your local government is doing. This is the news that Facebook provides to me. <laughs> but um, but um, if you think about, uh, for example, um, Corona tracking apps, suddenly it turned out it was Apple or Google who decide on what scheme, what solution is going to be made uh, for the tracking apps and not the governments. So this is where the power is, is where the decision is, is being made. And then <clears throat> uh, platforms as enforcers. If you think about um, regulatory strategies concerning content moderation, they are imposed, they are enforced by platforms. And suddenly it is the platform who imposes the uh, policy maybe state made, but state doesn't have to do anything with the, with the way it is uh, imposed. Uh, so actually it, it en even further enhances power of the platform, even though regulatory policy was supposed to mitigate it. So <laughs> how the situation looks like, we already have several instruments that apply directly or indirectly to platform uh, situation. First, general data protection regulation. And, you know, this is a pride and joy of the European Union. We really adore being the deal breakers when it comes uh, to how the standard of, of uh, data protection should look like. Then we have regulation that deals exactly with platform to business problem. As I said, abuse of power uh, in terms of, of platform, platform regulation, platform market, online platform market, uh, is more about how the business suffers because platform forces it into certain situations that are, might not be um, optimal, optimal from the point of view of the business. But this um, regulation focuses on uh, transparency. Um, the transparency regarding the main parameters determining rankings, um, relative importance of the um, that are taking into consideration when establishing rankings, whether platforms engage in the differentiated treatment, ex uh, extent of access to data, but it's purely informational. Uh, the, this regulation does not ban any practices or prescribe any conduct of platforms. It provides a bit stronger protection uh, to business user, users in other areas. For example, period of at least 15 days before the platform can implement changes to its terms and conditions. But just, you know, uh, be, be informed we are going to do it. Uh, 
obliging platforms to set up internal complaint handling system, uh, possibility uh, of mediation, but this does not apply to small platforms. Um, so it's just like a beginning, I would say. Then we have uh, commission guidelines on ranking transfer transparency, uh, which complements the regulation. Uh, and it aims to assist providers in applying the requirements and help optimize the manner in which the main parameters uh, determining rankings are identified. Then we have very specific <coughs> regulation that addresses uh, dissemination of terrorist content online. And it, evidently it serves to counter the spread of extremist uh, ideologies online. Um, basically platforms will have to remove terrorist contents referred by member state authorities within one hour. So it must be very swift. Uh, member states will be able to sanction non-compliance and to decide on the level of penalties. Uh, the size of the platform will be taken into, in, into consideration. So there, there's going to be a different a differentiated uh, approach towards small and big. Uh, and it's going to enter into force, uh, apply as of uh, uh, June 2022. Uh, then we have also code of contact uh, on country uh, uh, hate speech online just rules and community standards that prohibits uh, hate speech and put in place system and teams to review content. Then we have <clears throat> directive uh, on better enforcement uh, and modernization of union consumer protection rules, so-called omnibus. And omnibus uh, directive, it introduced changes to the already existing consumer um, uh, instruments. Uh, to enhance protection in terms of what's going on on platform. Uh, those are changes to unfair commercial practices directive, you have it um, on the slide, and changes to consumer rights directive. Uh, and maybe the, uh, it's important to stress what is um, with consumer rights directive. So the platform operator has to mention whether the, um, the contractual partner of consumer is a trader, because that would trigger consumer protection. But, you know, at the end of the day, platforms enforce this, protect force this protection uh, 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 on parties that offer services to consumers. So in practice, I'm, I'm not really sure how much it will change because platforms already do that. Uh, what will we have? <clears throat> and this is this huge legislative debate that is uh, part of a really wide debate on the digital future of Europe. So we have two, <clears throat> two um, legislative acts in the pipeline, Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act, and they are um, interconnected and the DSA is primarily concerned with transparency and consumer protection. It, it, it applies to all intermediaries, but differentiates between the rules that uh, apply to them depending on the size. And DMA targets the lack of competition in digital mar market, where, mar where, where platforms create um, entry barriers. Uh, so it targets specific uh, huge uh, or large online platforms. Uh, you have the specifics on the on the uh, slide. Um, the Digital Services Act is is based on traditional European approach, which is uh, a liability exemption. So platforms and other intermediaries are not liable for users and level behavior unless they are aware of illegal acts and fail to remove them. There is no general oblig obligation to monitor. Actually, there is a prohibition. Um, there are measures to counter illegal goods in a Digital Services Act, new obligation on trace uh, traceability, safeguards for users, uh, that will, they will have a possibility to challenge um, content moderation decisions, transparency measures, and extra obligation for very large platforms, so-called VLOPs. Uh, and this is this is maybe interesting because um, 
these very large platforms, uh, which are um, there are criteria criteria in the in the act uh, which platforms are those will have additional obligations to fulfill. Um, they are required to conduct annual risk assessment regarding illegal content, negative effects of fundamental rights, and international intentional manipulation of their services. And they will have to subject themselves to uh, independent audits concerning transparency and due diligence effort. And this is maybe something that is of interest for the Global South because it shows how European Union falls short when dealing with, with platforms. Because what it requires is essentially, hey, Google, please, let us know what systemic risks do you pose uh, to the to European Union. And now Google is going to tell us how it poses risks. Uh, so yeah, this is quite, um, uh, quite an interesting aspect. Um, what, when it comes to enforcement, it's going to be um, member states, uh, and European Union, which is uh, European Commission. And what the latest developments in this area, because they are being negotiated, those acts are being negotiated, is that the European Commission will have exclusive powers to enforce, uh, to enforce when it comes to very large online platforms. And this is actually, I think, a good solution because the system at systemic risks cannot be handled at the national level. M member states, national states are simply too weak. But what it um, gives us, oh, sorry, I, I forgot to mention the Artificial Intelligence Act, which is also very, very important, has been put forward in the, um, uh, pushed down the legislative pipeline. So it is also being negotiated. But uh, as I said, not very uh, optimistic uh, um, conclusions. Because you know the, the the platform market is already functioning. This is exposed intervention, so it's going to be difficult uh, to handle, especially considering how strong the uh, platforms already are. Uh, then the complexity of matter matches complexity of the power struggle. Uh, if you take a look on the DSA and the DM, DMA. They combine everything, especially DSA. Uh, illegal content, illegal goods, illegal services are treated the same way. So uh, misinformation, hate speech, and, uh, and uh, defective goods or services that do not match the description, contractual description. This is really a mixture that is going to be very difficult to digest. And specifically European context is that, you know, at the one hand, you have 27 countries that cooperate together to face the challenges of the uh, market uh, uh, organized by online platforms by very, very strong players of a global um, um, dimension. Uh, but at the same time, European Union has limited competences, has to act within the um, within what is attributed to it. And what you can see already is that the regulation of online platforms are, is really complex, is scattered. You, you will have difficulties to find what rules really apply because you already have several instruments that apply and there is no consistency between the instruments. So, uh, yeah, but you know, this is lawyer speaking. Lawyer always sees problems. So thank you very much. I manage, I stop now. Thank you, Aneta, for a broad view of the situation of regulation in Europe. Uh, so next, uh, your next speaker, speaker will be Renata Avila. Sorry, I say she's a Brazilian. In fact, she's from Guatemala. Renata, Renata Avila and, and other, spe other speaking here, we are short in time. So I, I ask you to stay in 10 minutes uh, limit that we established, okay? Thank you, uh, Renata. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, 
Thank you, Enrique. As I said, as I commented in the chat, it would be like a, the a speedy nationalization. It would be like a pleasure and an honor to be Brazilian, actually. Uh, uh, I, I love the country very much. And one of the things that I, I love about Brazil the most is that Brazil, and I, I, I start the conversation with this, was a visionary of an open web was the a country that was visionary in establishing open rules for everyone for a country in the global south to participate unfortunately you know like uh, in the first decade of 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 uh, the century something happened and what happened and is relevant for this conversation is the equivalent of what happened to trains and public transport when when the car was invented and that was the mobile phone you know and the mobile phone having mobile phones and being the default uh, means of communication for global south countries completely closed the opportunities for many completely closed the opportunities of an open web where everybody could have the a chance when we think uh, from the global south perspective uh, when we think about uh, when we compare uh, the past the, the first decade of the century when e e like it was relatively like you know um low investment really decentralized the possibility of open and online business and we contrast it today with the structure that platforms push us into it it really has changed like having a, 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 a digital environment where a platform and an app is the default way for everybody for the global poor to connect has really blocked the opportunities, opportunities to flourish for the global poor themselves. And that's a very interesting point that we do not discuss enough. I do not think that we are even discussing at this point the possibility of a, of a post-platform future, because actually is, it is the centralized, uh, the, like, the close structure the extractive structure of platforms that, uh, that it, it is the departing point of many of the problems that we are facing today. And uh, if, if, you, if we reflect you know, on the economic benefits of platforms, what we really see in, in, um, in the Global South is a, a structure that is socializing the cost and privatizing the profits. And privatizing the profits in a, in a very clever way because it's free riding in a system that really like uh, took advantage of globalization and, and, and on, on the global rules that the jurisdictions where most of the, the, the dominant platforms come from to basically evade taxes, do not contribute to society and do not evade to like, you know, rules like, like labor rules, environmental rules and um, public law in general. And we are not, I mean, the Global South, if I think of countries like Guatemala, we are not the European Union, you know. We are far away from it. In, 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 uh, in having leverage, I mean, like, we, like the, big, the largest platforms do not even have an office in our countries, unlike in Brazil, you know. There's tiny little markets, you know, like, and, and, and paying this very high cost and giving away the possibilities of having a, a future of our own. There's many things to consider on, on when we think about uh, platform regulation from a Global South perspective. The first reality check is that we have the hands tied by free trade agreements that we're like often uh, you know, pushed to, to sign. Uh, if, uh, if I think of uh, Central America and the, uh, the CAFTA, DR CAFTA, and, and the updated version is coming to, to us and it would be like signed with blind, you know, because we have to sign it, it really impedes uh, us from like, having a regulation that is like that resembles the, the regulation of the European Union that we just listened to now. As we have seen, for example, in a, in a recent you know, like attempt at changing the policies of WhatsApp, um, we, what the, the leverage is very, very little that we, we, we could have like, with, with this like, you know, abrupt changes of policies that we, we just have to sign sign in and say yes, because the reality is that our small and micro enterprises, our, like the poorest, uh, the poorest uh, people in, in our countries depend absolutely 
in four, uh, in four or five platforms to like conduct businesses to exist even. If you think of uh, also the vulnerability of countries in the global south of sanctions, a sanction in a, a, a small country like I, 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 Nicaragua comes to my mind, you know, like can you, you know completely wipe out of uh, the, the small businesses that rely on Facebook for bookings, for example, or for advertising on Google Maps to exist in, in, in the telephone to be, uh, to be able to, to find your small business in, in a rural area. So all, all these, uh, all these uh, conversation and this provocation that I'm, I'm presenting is like, it, it will look very different if we, will, if we will be trying to regulate platforms in the global south and regulation might be impossible. And it might be necessary to think a post-platform architecture for online uh, that goes a little bit back to the web we had, uh, but it rescues elements of, of the web we want, uh, to think of a more distributed fu digital future where the global poor, where the small countries, where the small players can, again, have a say and have a business that is functional and serves people without being like swallowed by these giants and uh, that are divided and is interoperable again. Uh, that's the dream I have. And it's, it's time to imagine something post-platform uh, for us to like uh, recover autonomy and sovereignty, digital sovereignty from the global self perspective. Thank you, Renata. Uh, excellent. In fact, we bring the discussion here for your region, for the global south, in specific to Latin America. And I, I hope to have questions in the audience on the debate phase about that. Uh, next, uh, we will have Mr. Subhash Badra. And uh, please, Subhash, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'll try to share my screen, but at the same time, I too am suffering from from cold, so in case I I just need to switch off my video to sneeze, please excuse me. Um, so look, I think uh, for many reasons, um, India becomes an interesting um, case uh, from the regulation of platforms uh, perspective because sure it's global south, but at the same time with China having shunted out a bunch of these platforms, it is their biggest market. One in four people who are on WhatsApp are in India. So I think it gives India a unique amount of leverage. And I think that kind of that's leading to a very interesting to put it uh, mildly uh, kind of dynamic here. And I want to, in this presentation, uh, walk the, the audience through, through some of that. Uh, so just to start with, right, I think the context in which this is playing out in India is like many global South countries is one of rap rapid internet adoption. Uh, about half a billion people in India, and these are somewhat dated numbers, half a billion people in India access the internet and that's grown very, very rapidly over the past four or five years. Most of the people are online through smartphones. So many people just leapfrog the computer and broadband and all of that. And it's all mobile internet. Uh, so for them, uh, very often the internet means just WhatsApp and Facebook. So I think that's a very interesting dynamic. Thirdly, the Indians actually consume the most amount of data on their mobile phones, which is significantly higher than the US and Europe. This was 9.8 a few years back. I think the latest numbers are like some 14 GB a month. So because of the falling prices of the of data, in, Indians have emerged as the largest uh, consumers of data in the world on a per capita basis. Uh, and about half a billion people are expected to come online between 2017 and 2022, which means that these are all people who are on the internet for the first time. These are first generation internet users. They haven't been accustomed to the internet for long and all of that. Uh, and this is all leading to, at a very fundamental level, you know, we like to say data is changing India. Uh, I think the India we used to imagine 10 years ago is not the India anymore. Uh, I think it is, there's, there's a lot more startup activity. There's a, the, the social political dynamic has completely changed. Uh, and I think, you know, when even when you look at platforms, I think it's important to realize and remember that these platforms are at the end of they happen in a society and there's a very complex relationship and fundamentally that these platforms are changing uh, the society that they inhabit. Uh, 
as I've gone through this earlier, which is to say that the kind of folks who are now coming online uh, in India in the last five years are people like vegetable vendors, garment factory workers, domestic help, security guards, uh, right? And these are the people whose lives therefore become extremely dependent on uh, and affected by uh, these platforms as they as they get rolled out. I mean, the top layer, kind of the rich and middle income have probably had internet for uh, maybe a decade or two decades, but it's, it's this class of aspirers who are now uh, coming online for the first time. So with all of that said, uh, and Anita uh, you know, went through some of this, but at least the way I look at digital platforms is that there are four defining features and which is also what separates them from, you know, we've had big pharma before, we've had big tobacco, big oil, we've had dominant private sector platforms, but our private sector companies, but what makes digital platforms very different is the data centric model. It's, and if you think of data as an embodiment of the human, because my data is about me. So because of this, there's a very intense link between these platforms and me as an individual, which wasn't true of earlier companies. Network effects, and Anita uh, has already spoken about it uh, fairly uh, in, in detail. Then there's an infrastructural role that a lot of the economy these days is now built on top of these platforms. So unlike, uh, you know, a big farm or a big oil, which was uh, operating in a silo from the rest of the economy, big tech is and digital platforms are embedded in the rest of the economy and most importantly they play a very important civic function i think never before have private companies uh, been moderators of a constitutionally guaranteed right in any country and i think uh, the importance of this moment cannot be understated so if you look at these four as the characteristics of digital platforms uh, something that's really unique uh, in india is that we aren't only talking about the Facebooks and Amazons of the world. I think there's something very interesting going on in India uh, that the government is out to build many digital platforms. And I think somewhat unique in the world and I am going to walk through that. But at the same time, while China took the route of shunting everyone out and building their own platforms, I think in India also there's the emergence of dom domestic and large platforms which are going to compete with the global platforms or be co-opted or co-opt the global platforms in many ways. And I'm going to walk through that as well. So first, first things first, right? I mean, I think one aspect of digital platforms in India is just the traditional big tech companies that we are all very familiar with. Uh, and again, just the scale of some of this is really important to grasp. Uh, when we talk about digital payments in India, which has been one of our massive successes over the past many years, Google is the most dominant platform in digital payments in India. There are 300, and 300 million users of Google Pay in India, and it has the largest market share. Uh, it, India is an Android market, it completely dominated by Google. Uh, Amazon has a very large share in the e-commerce uh, um, in the e-commerce sector. Again, the users of WhatsApp, Facebook, just very, very large numbers. And average Indian spends almost an hour on Facebook every day. So these big tech global and mostly US big tech platforms are deeply embedded in, in, in Indians' lives. But at the same time, we see a tendency for domestic uh, 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 companies to actually start playing the game that big tech platforms have. And that is by integrating different layers of the value chain. So in India, for example, there's a very large company called Reliance Geo owned by the, uh, by the richest man in India and probably I think the richest man in Asia. And his company has entered into many partnerships with uh, different players in a way that it is building top to down is building its presence in that entire value chain. And I think the long-term aspiration of this company, many allege, uh, is really to be as dominant and as embedded uh, in everyone's lives in, in the way that, uh, that global platforms are. So for example, Google and Facebook have pumped in billions of dollars into this company uh, with, the, with, with the intention to come up with partnerships, come up with common platforms, with devices, et cetera. So I think there's something very interesting going on here with respect to the presence of domestic uh, tech platforms. But what's probably most interesting in India is that the government itself comes in and says, you know what, we are going to actually build that platform out. So uh, India's digital ID story, I think most people are very familiar with, but beyond India's digital ID story, we've had uh, a, a payments infrastructure that was built by a quasi government entity. Uh, and that payment infrastructure has basically destroyed the monopoly of credit card businesses and has created a different kind of platform dynamic. Uh, there is an intention to actually open up financial sector data through a quasi-government data exchange. 
Uh, there are talks about building an e-commerce platform, which will reduce the monopoly powers of e-commerce players in India. So I think uh, a lot of interesting things happening with the government stepping in and in sector after sector saying that the platform layer should be owned by the government and owned by society uh, and that it's only the application layer that should be built by the private sector. And so I think there's a kind of very interesting dynamic between the public and private sector that is playing out in digital platforms in India. But at the same time, while I think we are all very familiar with all the downsides of platforms, I think it is important to understand the global in the global south context, pla digital platforms also have a positive role to play. To the extent that uh, Amazon or other e-commerce players make it easier for small businesses to reach their uh, reach their beneficiaries in a way that WhatsApp makes it easier for businesses to reach their beneficiaries, I think they have had a very significantly positive impact on the Indian ecosystem. Uh, they have innovated a lot on terms of the vernacular languages and other technologies, and that has really helped the wider community as well, obviously, uh, with, with the big tech kind of watching out for its own benefits. These are informational gateways. The information explosion that we've seen in India has happened because of these platforms. Uh, a lot of customized experiences and customized services that they have provided. And at the same time, sometimes in a global South country like India, there is really low state capacity. And sometimes these platforms come and bridge that state capacity because they have access to data, uh, they have access to capital, they have access to technology that very often governments will not have. And so even if you look at, for example, COVID, uh, when that broke out, there was a lot of interesting applications of the data that was coming out of these platforms that could be used for policy making purposes. At the same time, there's a negative aspect to all of these market power, we all know the competitive anti competitive behavior, we know the problem with misinformation, we know the problem with privacy violations, etc. So I don't need to go over that. But just to make the reiterate the point that in the global south, I think the discussion is a lot more complex, because they do have platforms do have positive impacts on society. Um, India, I think, again, from a regulatory perspective, because that is basically the question that we are asking ourselves today, there is a personal data protection bill built on broadly GDPR uh, uh, kind of frameworks with much wider exemptions to government that is now in advanced stages. India was the first country in the world to bring out and adopt net neutrality, uh, which put a full stop to uh, uh, free basics. Uh, and at the same time, we've uh, we, even on e-commerce, for example, foreign, we've had for long the fact that uh, for foreign companies cannot have self-dealing on their platforms. A very interesting regulatory innovation in India that is being discussed is around non-personal data, that all the non-personal data that is being collected by platforms should it actually become open data. Uh, and there is a proposal, uh, the government set up a committee, there's a proposal that this is the way that it could work and wherein any company that achieves a certain size will have to make its non-personal data that it collects accessible to everyone else. There are geopolitical bans. Uh, India has used that very often with, uh, with Chinese apps, uh, but at the same time, there's always a threat that you know, Twitter or the social media uh, channels could be, could be banned as well. Uh, a very interesting thing that happened earlier this year in India was new intermediary liability rules wherein India actually mandated traceability. So every the first originator of a WhatsApp message has to be, uh, WhatsApp has to collect and be able to identify them. Uh, there has been mandatory takedown of social media content within 36 hours, voluntary uh, verification of people through uh, ID, ID uh, identity on digital platforms and all of that. So I think there's been a lot of debate and discussion about what impact that has had on free speech, but at the same time, read some really good and forward looking measures as well. For example, grievance redressal officers and transparency reports. So a lot of lot to unpack there. But finally, as I had earlier alluded to that the Indian government is building out or promoting digital platforms in various sectors. And one that, for example, will be very interesting to watch is one in e commerce, and it's called open network for digital commerce. And the idea there is can e commerce also be unbundled in a way that for example, in Amazon or, Flip, or in India, Walmart owned Flipkart doesn't have dominance across the entire value chain. And you basically modularize the, the value chain in a way you break their monopolies. So I think in many ways, India is doing a lot of innovative regulation, non-personal data, digital infrastructures, et cetera, traceability. And I think it'll be interesting to watch how all of this plays out. Um, and finally, I will end with this, right? That I, again, we just have to look at 
uh, what context is playing out and many of these might be relevant for other global south countries that there is an interventionist government which says you know what platforms aren't performing let us step in there is a geopolitical digital wars with china there is a certain tension with the us there's tech nationalism that indian startups and indian companies must own the data there's active civil society uh, because there's a lot of pushback there's a lot of strategic litigation going on India as a sandbox that you're trying new and new ideas here, both the public and the private sector, and all of that playing out in the market, which for big tech is their biggest market globally. So I think lots of interesting things happening here and happy to dive into any of this in Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Subahish, for this or uh, all this information about India situation and showing us uh, how the big techs and the platforms are different from other uh, power, other 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 situations in the economy like oil and electricity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker will be Emmanuel Vitus. Uh, she's from he's from the private sector from Africa. Please, Emmanuel, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emmanuel Vitus. I'm a researcher and uh, the national convener of the Togo IGF. So I'm gonna talk about the evolution of um, the digital platform on the African continent and how regulation today pose a real problem on the continent. So as you may be aware, the evolution of digital platform have prompted governments across the continent to start regulating uh, this platform beyond the existing traditional laws and uh, this is because in recent years we have observed uh, a number of challenges like cyberbullying, the online gender violence, and other form of targeted online violence that are already present in other parts of the world. So but, uh, those violence across the continent has actually cut the internet users, you know, between government effort to regulate those online harms and social media platforms, which alternate between ignoring the problem or launching a broad you know, crack down on uh, the user's speech. So I will take it from two different perspectives. First, from the government perspective and from those tech giants perspective as well, and also propose um, a few recommendations, you know, as experts in the field, so that those um, uh, from the government and also from those private uh, sector or online platform can also team up to bring a kind of uh, uh, multi-stakeholder approach of uh, regulation. So from a government perspective, you know, in Africa, uh, in recent years, most laws, you know, enacted by the government on the continent uh, seek to regulate the online harm like disinformation and online violence. They end up, you know, targeting legitimate online speech instead. So I've actually um, looked at it broadly. So if you take, for example, the Nigeria Cybercrime Act or the Uganda Computer Misuse Act, the Kenya Computer and Cybercrime Act, or the Malawi Electronic Transaction and Cybersecurity Act. All those acts come, let's say, in less than five years now. So uh, every African government trying to learn from each other, you know, on how to regulate. But what we have noticed in those different acts that those governments are actually enacting is that most of them are vaguely worded and uh, they can be you know weaponized to stifle dissidents so that's what we have observed especially in countries where uh, freedom of speech is not uh, available or they are not democratic the the leaders use those regulations to actually stifle uh, dissidents instead of uh, regulating it to help their economy so in some instances, for example, we've noticed that African uh, government uh, shut down the internet uh, just as a measure to regulate the, uh, how do you call it, uh, online speech or a measure to regulate online platforms. So we have observed those trends in uh, most of the countries, like um, uh, in Togo, in countries like Cameroon, in countries uh, like uh, Uganda, in countries like Congo, where it has become a trend in Ethiopia, in Algeria, like almost every part of the continent, they use it as the easiest way to, to regulate the platform, usually when it comes to election or when it comes to uh, public protest or when it comes to national exams. Those are like the easiest way for the African government to, to, to regulate you know, uh, those platforms. 
which are, we all agree that are not the, the best, but it's because usually uh, those governments don't look at uh, don't look at it on the Western way. We look at it as you know a threat, and as I said, it goes with democracy because if you look at most of the countries that actually uh, shut down the internet as a regulation, you know, to protect the online platforms. Um, usually they are not democratic countries. You notice that most rulers in those countries have stayed in power more than uh, two terms or more than 15 years. So they see the internet as uh, a threat, especially giving the voices to you know, the, the younger generation, uh, the activists in the past in Africa, for example, they used to go on the street, they used to protest, they used to you know, uh, show their muscles, but now it's not the same case. Now everybody sits and you know, with 100 character on Twitter, you say your mind, you say whatever you want to say to the government. So we have observed the trend since the Arab Spring in 2011 till date, every African government is facing that same uh, challenge. So the easiest way for them to regulate is either come up with those laws, and they, usually, as I said, the laws are usually vague and very easy for the, the, the government to, to use it or misuse it uh, as they want. Uh, we have laws, for example, in countries like Nigeria, where the government, uh, there are articles, for example, when they said, if what you say is annoying to the government, you know, uh, who define what is annoying. So those are like some of the West, for example, government across the continent learn from each other. And usually if you notice people that they arrest, you know, uh, for publishing things online, etc., are usually dissident. They are not people, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they actually arrest just for their opinion, but they also arrest them because of their, you know, uh, uh, political parties they belong to. So it has become a very uh, big challenge. And from the social media uh, perspective, uh, the social media perspective, uh, they also face a very peculiar uh, regulatory challenges in the African context, because uh, usually uh, those social media, like um, if I take Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, et cetera, they usually design uh, one size fits all. I mean, like if it's okay for the US market, it's okay for the African market. That's how the regulation come. But you know, we live in different parts of the world. And in Africa, usually, let me give basic example. Facebook, for example, use algorithm to fight hate speech. But in Africa, you cannot use algorithm to fight hate speech because people post things in their local languages. And Africa has like 800, you know, local languages, and it's almost impossible for those platforms like Facebook, et cetera, to define algorithm to detect certain words, for example, to, to, to fight online speech. So it becomes uh, very difficult, and we notice that the one size fits all does not work really uh, in the African uh, context. And we also notice in recent years, for example, if you take um, WhatsApp, for example, during the COVID pandemic, it has become a platform on which, for example, the hate speech uh, spread as quickly as possible because usually due to the digital literacy level of the continent, people prefer sending audio messages uh, to their be uh, beloved. So when they send those messages, it's difficult, for example, for those uh, digital platform to try to regulate uh, this content. So you see the spread of fake news, you see the spread of uh, videos and uh, content that are so difficult for algorithm uh, to fight. So on the continent, it become uh, more and more uh, difficult for uh, those platforms. Now, uh, from uh, uh, an expert view, what can African government and those uh, social media platform can do, you know, to regulate uh, those platform because we notice that more and more people are getting uh, connected on the continent, and uh, we don't have uh, local solutions by local solutions I mean we don't have local platforms, so most of the platform on the continent come from the US, and again, uh, the necessity is we they should now look at look at it from the African perspective when it comes to regulation. Because when they don't look at it that way, usually what happens is the African government uh, give them the responsibility to do that. And if they are not able to do it, what they do is they go the hard way. So we have cases, for example, in Nigeria, right now where Twitter is banned, you know, for months now uh, in the country. We had countries like Chad, where uh, the government banned social media for a whole year where people don't have access to social media. Or we have countries like Uganda or Benin, where government try to put a tax just on social media so that people pay before you know, publishing their content online aside their internet 
data that they buy. They should pay for you know, social media tasks, et cetera. So it becomes a challenge and there is necessity for both the government and the uh, online platforms to team up to come out with you know, um, compliance, I mean, laws that are uh, in compliance with international human rights standard. Because usually, as I said, the laws in Africa, they came in such a way that uh, uh, it's difficult for people to even have time to contribute. Sometimes you just wake up in the morning and they say the government has voted a new bill for social media. And when you go into it, it doesn't actually respect any human rights uh, based approach. So uh, it's more or less um, an attempt for the government to just quickly you know, uh, solve the problem instead of looking at it you know, in the longer term. And also we also have the non-participation of uh, state, uh, non-state actors. So usually the bill come from the parliament, so they are the policy makers, and they come from the government usually. So it's difficult, for example, for civil society, for private sector, by private sector, I mean those tech giants as well, to contribute you know, into those laws. So it become more, uh, more and more difficult. So the academics, they are there, the international human rights organizations are there, and they are willing you know, to contribute to those process, but those process are not usually uh, open you know, for a multi-stakeholder uh, approach. And uh, what I can say from uh, my observation on the entire continent is it will be difficult, you know, if African uh, government continue to uh, move on silos, it will be very difficult. They have to, you know, come up with uh, uh, regulation that are really harmonized on continent level. Like for example, if you take the European level with the GDPR, every, you know, country in the world now comply when they are exchanging their data with Europe. But in Africa, it's not the same. Every government, you know, go its own way. But because they are not powerful economically as well, it's very difficult for them because some countries on the continent, for example, if you take their annual GDP is equal to, you know, uh, what those social media platforms make in a month. So it's quite difficult to, to face those giants and fight them if we don't come out with, you know, a, a continental, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, frameworks that are more inclusive uh, to, to fight or regulate uh, those platforms. So I think I will end it here and I'll be open, you know, to answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, for all this information from Africa situation. And uh, we see how important it is to uh, the, the problem of regulating platforms in different geographies. Uh, next, uh, we have the uh, Agustina Ordonez. Uh, she's the last speaker, please. Uh, Agustina, uh, try to stay in the 10 minutes mark because we are short of time. And I believe you have. Uh, much material to discuss to, to, today. Thank you, uh, Agustina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much for the invitation and for having me here. So I'm gonna speak about uh, what to consider when regulating social media platforms, and I will focus especially in the Argentinian case. So why do they need to be regulated? I think that's the main question. And the answer that I found is because we need to guarantee human rights, freedom of expression and privacy. And after that, we can ask, okay, so, but where should we start? Like in, in which part? So I think there are three main things that need to be regulated. That is content moderation, personal data, and the lack of investment that these companies have in the countries where they operate. So in, their, in Argentina, we have two main international treaties. One is the American Convention on Human Rights, and the other one is uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. There are the skeleton for the, this regulation. So regarding uh, content moderation, we don't have a specific law, but we have a jurisprudence from a case uh, from uh, Maria Belen Rodriguez, who was a model, and she sued Google and Yahoo like 20 years ago, because uh, they use her image for pornography and erotic means. And the court said that even though uh, the search engineers were not and are not responsible for the content that people share, they are responsible when they become aware of a criminal content and they do nothing about it. Regarding personal data, we have three main laws. One, it's a uh, protection de los datos personales, so it's the protection of personal data, avias data, and Argentina Digital, or Digital Argentina. 
And what these three main laws have is that the, the important thing is uh, all your personal data belongs to you. And what do we mean with personal data? So personal data is anything that can be linked to your profile, to your, to your identity. So for example, your ID uh, of the computer, that's your personal data. Your phone number is your personal data. Your email is your personal data. It's not only about your name or your age. It's anything that can be used to say, okay, you are this person. And uh, these laws are protected by, uh, by, by this, the personal data law. And what they say is that the companies cannot use your personal data without your consent. And nowadays you have to agree, like uh, yesterday I was uh, on Infobuy, that is a website, and they say it appeared a message asking me to consent to share my personal data and if I say no, they cannot use it. And that personal data belongs to me. So for example, I can go and ask them not to uh, share it with other parties, or uh, I, I'm, I'm willing to know what are they doing with this personal data. And I think one of the most important things that we have is the privacy of traffic data associated. So the thing is, no one can access to your personal data the only way uh, someone can access is with a request of a judge. So that's for the, the privacy part. And one thing, this is not a law, it's a guide, but I think it's, it's more like a principle. I think it's important to have is uh, the use of personal data for electoral purposes. So uh, they, they say that it, okay, so it's not a law, but they say that all your personal data cannot be used for other purposes. And this should apply also in uh, electoral purposes. So even though it's not an existing regulation, it means that uh, personal data that is used for electoral purposes is still personal data and it should be under the same law. And the local um, communities, so the investment, there is a lack of investment in the countries where they operate. Usually they don't even have an office or a staff or an address where we can go. In Argentina, we don't have um, any taxation specifically for social media platforms, but what we have is um, taxes for uh, foreign uh, streaming services. So it's like Netflix and Disney Plus. But the thing is that those taxes are paid by the users and not by the companies. And one more law to take into account is the consumer protection law that says that all the information that these companies gives to us, they, it needs to be in our own language. It has to be simple. It has to be, um, well, real. So, and if not, we can like go to the court and sue them if, if they don't do this. So what can we learn from the Argentinian case? So in content moderation, I believe the most important thing is that to be aware or not to, we have been talking and discussing this uh, over this week, the, the importance of freedom of expression. So just to not tackle it, the search engineers and the social media platforms are responsible for the content they have on their sites only when they become aware that it's a criminal content and they do nothing about it. So they don't remove it, but they're not responsible for what people post only in this case. And another thing that is really important is that the removal of the content should be based on their home country's understandings and laws where it operates, not from where it's based. Because usually they say, okay, so this is not uh, something that is against the, I don't know, the law in, in in the US because there is where they have their, their where they is based, but maybe in our country it is. So it has to be with the legislation of the country where it operates. Regarding personal data, so all it's personal data. So everything that you share and not even you, even if someone else shares something, or for example, someone uh, take a picture with you and then he or she put it on Facebook and, and tag your name, that's personal data, even though you are not sharing yourself. 
because it can be linked to you. And all social media platforms need to have the consent to use our personal data. And what we have um, in Argentina that, well, the, I think the, mo the, the problem we have is with um, enforcement of all these things, right? So what we have is a re registration for all the companies and NGOs and even the, um, the government, they need to uh, register if they have a personal data base and they need to have a responsible for that data. So if something happens with that data, we know who to sue or who to go to or who to, I don't know, to ask for our data. The investment in local economy, I believe uh, the most important thing is that people should not, I mean, people already pay taxes. So this company needs to start paying taxes as not more or less than other companies that operate in, 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 the, in the country. And they should definitely have an office and a minimum staff so we can go and, and we can ask things. And if we want something to be removed, for instance, uh, in Argentina, we speak Spanish. And if you want to say something to, for example, Facebook or Instagram, you will have to email them in English and that's a barrier. And well, obviously they should be rich in, uh, for the, the people should be able to reach them in their own country. And in a case of litigation, and this is really important, the application of the law should be in the country where it operates. So if it operates in Argentina, it goes to the, the application of the law of Argentina, not of the US. So thank you, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Augustina. Uh, so uh, now you have uh, some time for questions for the audience. I believe the, the session is very good. So uh, uh, it's a pitch that you have so few time to discuss the, those issues. And uh, we see how important it's to uh, see how to regulate uh, platforms uh, in different ways regarding the Global South situation. Uh, my first question, uh, we have some questions of, also from the audience, but my first question is, uh, somehow uh, regulating platforms will involve the work uh, and the effort from the platforms themselves. I mean, it's not easy to regulate platforms without the cooperation of the, the platform. So uh, we, we talk uh, mostly on uh, self-regulation with regulation together, co-regulation and things like that. So I have, uh, would like to have inputs from the, our speakers about this uh, trend of the, the necessity of the state to govern the power of the platform but uh, how to do it uh, together with the platforms in a self-regulation or co-regulation uh, way. Uh, please, uh, I, put, I put this question to, the, to, to all the speakers. Uh, so if you, uh, one of you could uh, respond, uh, it will be, I will be very glad. Thank you. Renato? Yeah, I would like to start, you know, like I, I strongly, I strongly disagree with the idea of self-regulation or co-regulation, especially if you are like in a country in the global south, because uh, we have seen what has happened in recent times with Facebook and with all these companies with uh, their like brilliant oversight boards and uh, apparent uh, like strong PR uh, signaling that they are doing something for the users and then you see that the priority is users in rich countries and serving the consumers in rich countries. And when we see like, you know, very sensitive and very um, dangerous issues such as uh, igniting, a, I mean, promoting a genocide in uh, Myanmar or, uh, you know, like all the social unrest and uh, confrontation among like, you know, ethnic groups right now in Ethiopia or uh, the, 
terrible management of elections in Honduras are like completely neglected and left for later. Uh, companies, like the main goal is profit, is not serving people necessarily. And, and if we have a weak government, uh, it is like the vulnerability and the possibilities of, uh, of these companies writing their own regulation is high. So I, I believe that uh, instead of uh, co-regulation, uh, I think that what we need is a broader um, Global South countries alliances, like, you know, like a third, third block of countries uh, agreeing on uh, stronger regulation uh, and uh, stronger standards that are not necessarily inspired by uh, or dictated by uh, G20 countries, basically, but by the logic of the smaller players in the game. Thank you, Renata. Uh, we have other question. Uh, say, we have a, a big buzz around big techs, uh, huge corporations, monopolies, and market concentration. Uh, there is also a, a common sense about the possibility of unbundling some of these companies. Uh, how do we envision uh, uh, the appropriate way to regulate the platform according to their size and, and work stream? Uh, considering that some of them, uh, most of the users are located in the global south, how do you see this discussion that you using uh, uh, breaking the companies, how are made to avoid, uh, to attack the problem? Someone can talk? Sure, I can Please, jump Subhish. into that. Subhish. Yeah, I can jump into that one. That... I think many people now agree that breaking up the platforms by themselves, probably you'll have to be incredibly smart to actually pull that off. In, mo in most likelihood, it will not work because you'll probably do it somewhat imperfectly in a way that whatever the smaller parts are will also then become larger. Right? Um, because the structural uh, parameters of these, which is the network effects, the data centric models, the infrastructure rules, those are not going away. So as long as they stay, platforms will stay like that. I do want to uh, bring attention to something that I've been thinking about for several years and with parts, shades of which I think, uh, you know, you can see in the Indian government's approach uh, is of uh, platform interoperability. That if so much is dependent on their network effects, what happens if you really take away those network effects? So historically, for example, in, in payments, uh, because even if you see in, in China, there are these closed loop ecosystems where you can pay to someone who's on the same platform. Similarly, we can only chat on Facebook with someone who's on Facebook. But what India did was it made payments, it built a backbone such that different payment systems could chat with each other and you could send, I on Google Pay can send it to, send money to someone who's on Walmart's um, payments channel. So that has take, made the platform that has made all of this extremely interoperable in the sense that on payments, therefore, you do not have uh, the harms of monopolies that you see in other areas. So I think it is worth exploring instead of breaking up whether there is a possibility to make these interoperable. So hypothetically, if I could, the reason I am on WhatsApp uh, and not on just on Signal uh, is because I have to be there because my friends and family are there. But what if I could be on Signal and send a message to someone who's on WhatsApp? I think that will really uh, break the break the excessive power uh, that these companies have, not so much, you know, just kind of legally breaking them up. Thank you, Subahish. Uh, we have a lot of questions on the chat. I will go to a, a question from Luisa Malheiros. Uh, she's saying, uh, we've seen from the Facebook papers that besides the language problems, there is no transference about the content migration investments to Latin America, for instance. Uh, how could you address in terms of regulation this problem mentioned by Agustina about difficulty in prioritizing research for Latin America for the global south? This situation uh, arises for Africa very clearly, as uh, Emmanuel said also. Uh, anyone can respond? Yes. Uh, today, I think it's a matter of power. Uh, somebody earlier mentioned that um, uh, when you take those uh, platforms like um, uh, Facebook and um, Google, etc., do we co-regulate with them or 
government can go uh, with its power to regulate. Because as you said, there's no transparency. When any time government, you know, come out with a policy, they came out and say, no, we are doing our best. We are doing our best. We are working on our algorithm. We are working on a team. We are regulating. We are recruiting people to work on local languages. I mean, all these are, you know, uh, grammar and, you know, uh, diplomatic talk. But we need real, you know, um, change. We need to see the transparency to what level, for example, they are commit, you know, uh, to, to, to regulate those platforms. Because uh, in Nigeria, for example, the government of Nigeria was able to to ban Twitter for one reason, they have the market. They have the market and Twitter at a point know that, yes, we have to sit and negotiate with the government because we cannot do without them. Nigeria today have more than 200 million people. That's like the population of you know, half of Europe. So it's at a point you have to sit down with giants like Nigeria, for example, to have a conversation because it's a matter of sovereignty. Nigeria banned Twitter for one reason, they deleted the president's tweet. And the president said, well, you are a company like any other company and we are an institution. So I think at a point uh, we have to look at it, you know, in a broader way. That's why earlier I said a multi-stakeholder approach because we don't need individuals or companies to regulate, uh, how do you call it, uh, content on the continent. What we need is to have good laws and strong institutions, you know, to, 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 for the rule of law because at the end of the day is not who is doing it, is it what the law says. And if that law is a more stakeholder law, I don't think Facebook or Twitter or an individual will come against it because they are all part of it. So it's very important that we, we go on that direction uh, than thinking that anytime the problem arises, you know, we wait for either the government to come out with a law because the government always does it on its own way as, you know, um, a sovereign states. They do it on their own way. And if you are not lucky and you come to countries like Cameroon or Togo, where you have, you know, authoritarian regimes, they don't even look at, uh, how do you call it, the opportunity to regulate. They look at the opportunity to surprise dissidents. So it's very important that we go the multi-stakeholder way in drafting laws because it's only the laws that can be applied in the longer term. And also to conclude from what my colleague from Argentina said, it's difficult, for example, for someone today to go and sue somebody in the US because the cost involved is a lot for an African. So it's very important that if those giants come to the continent, the rule of law in those countries should be applied to them because today they hide behind you know, the US regulation saying that we are a US company and we don't have to be accountable you know, to any government around the world. If you have a problem, come to the US. I think that is one problem that needed to be solved. That's why I spoke earlier about you know, harmonization of you know, those frameworks on the continent because if we stand as one continent with more than you know, uh, 700 million people, is more strong than you know individual countries who are one less than one million people. So that is where I stand. We have to come out with a multi-stakeholder approach and also a regulation that is a continent drive regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. We are really short of time. Uh, we will finish in three minutes. Uh, so uh, I would like to first uh, to uh, say thank you to all the speakers for the excellent opportunity of discussing this question of regulating platforms on IGF. Uh, as I said before, CGIBR is conducting this discussion uh, on Brazil uh, since the beginning of this year. And uh, we are very glad to have this opportunity to discuss of expect experts from uh, all the regions of the world about this uh, important issue that all the nations are, are confronting uh, today. Uh, I, I have some, uh, I will pass the, the, the floor to Anita to say uh, a few points uh, about the, the question posted and, and uh, say again, thank you for all the audience and for the speakers. Anita, can you close the section because I don't know about the procedure, but maybe you will be out in two minutes. Please, Anita, make the wrap, wrap for me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure for me to listen to these um, uh, presentations, which were totally eye-opening. And whereas the um, significant... I think we share the same problems. Um, 
because the structure of the problem is the same. The question is how strong are we to answer them? And it is quite heartbreaking. And I, I, I intentionally use uh, emotional description to hear how uh, free trade agreements prevent from imposing um, legitimate democratic answer to clearly abusive practices. Uh, and I think that was uh, the same tune sounding in all of the presentations that the answer to the changing global market is uniform approach. And um, one country will not be able to address the issues. A congregation of countries might. And you know, I am quite often annoyed with the policy of uh, European Union because I find it too weak. Um, uh, and yes, I find it too weak, but um, at least there is um, incentive and uh, at least there is a certain background that is strong and can be enforced. And um, that also shows that there is a space to achieving this. And I think that what is happening in Europe is not enough. It's just the beginning. Um, and I, I'm just like, for me, it was a huge eye opener. And I, I'm really, really grateful for all these extremely interesting views for all the sides of the world. It, I'm, I'm, I'm making it personal, but it was incredibly interesting panel for me. Thank you very much.